Hey, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of our show. Of course, I'm John. Many of you have been asking about uh, the other half of the operation, Chris, and who is he and what does he do? And I'm going to have him talk to you in a, a, a minute about that. And again, if you like our channel, please do like, subscribe, and share. It does help the channel grow. Uh, Chris is our brains and looks behind the operation. I'm just doing my best to make him look as good as possible. Uh, he does a lot of our content and marketing, and he's been doing it for quite a while. So everyone, welcome, Chris. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hello, everybody. And how are you, John? Nice to uh, nice to finally well. come on camera with you. How's everything? Yeah, yeah. It's a long time coming. So it's uh, it's a good thing we're doing this. Um, Chris, to just have you briefly talk about uh, your background a little bit and kind of what you do in terms of the day-to-day -day operation, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I'll keep it brief. So um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris. I've got a channel, which um, I go by the name of Chris Real World. I've been in this community for the last two or three years. I own a company called The 1% Club. And what this company is, it's a platform online where we help like-minded people like yourself, John, and our viewers. We help them escape the system. We teach them how to make money with uh, different um, aspects rather than the, the matrix, should I call it. Try get them to come out of that. And yeah, so the last couple of years, I've had this platform due to some personal circumstances. I haven't been posting as much and I am trying to become active again. So um, yeah, that's why I've partnered up with John here. So me and John, we run the platform together now. And uh, John's been doing a great job at it and I'm bringing myself back. So I've got a few other businesses as well, which we will talk about these on a, another date. But today, yeah, that's all I wanna mention. We've got a, a platform. John's gonna take it from here. John's got a few things he would like to say as well. So back to you, John. Thanks. Thanks for doing that, Chris. Appreciate it. So, yeah, we, you know, we just wanted to clear the air. So we're being one of the things, folks, that we've always pride ourselves on is being honest and transparent and uh, uh, as communicative with you folks as possible. That's how we're going to engender uh, this platform to grow and, and have the relationship be a, a genuine and meaningful one. So now that you have a little bit of a foray into Chris's background, Chris, this channel that you're watching the real world was Chris's originally um, just in all transparency. He was working with uh, Mr. Trumptastic and I was very close with him and he likewise. And unfortunately after his passing, um, you know, when I would talk with Mr. T, he, he would always say to me towards the last few days to keep, keep up the fight and finish what we started. And I promised him that I would do that to the best of my ability. So that is how the genesis of this process happened whereby I'm working with Chris to uh, help us cross the finish line and win together. So. I came onto this platform sort of late in the game and, and just working with Chris to fill the gap of the things I was doing behind the scenes. Now, thanks to Chris, we have a bigger platform to get these messages out as much as possible. And we will keep working to improve it. And we are, we are watching your comments and taking your feedback and suggestions to heart accordingly, which is a perfect segue because that is the other thing that we wanna talk about is we're gonna do this every two weeks. And what we're gonna do is a Q and A starting today. We read the questions. Obviously you can appreciate how busy you are, how busy we are. We don't always have time to answer your questions in a timely manner, manner as much as we would like. So what we're doing in compensation of that is every two weeks, we'll compile a list of the most commonly asked questions and then some, answer some of the extraneous ones so that you feel like you're being addressed. So we do ask you, encourage to you know, revisit these videos, write stuff down so that you won't have to ask it again. You'll be able to retain it for future use. So with that in mind, I'm gonna to go to some of the, most recent shows we have and just take some questions and answer them out. So one of the most common questions, Chris, that we get, I'm sure you've seen it is, um, are, does it matter if the currency, will they exchange the currency if it's circulated or uncirculated? Does it make a difference? The answer is no. There was a time years ago where there was bantied about that maybe it made a difference to have new currency and they wouldn't take the old ones. But I've talked with some bankers, I've talked with some wealth managers, and I've just queried our team to make sure, and concurrently across the board, they've all concluded that as long as the currency is legitimate and it's certified, as long as it's not black market and you know you've tested it, because they're going to test it when you go to at the time of exchange, you're absolutely fine. So it makes no difference whether it's circulated or uncirculated for the record. Another question I got here is, are, what about these Zimbabwe agro checks? Good question. 
Yes, um, they will be honored and redeemed, just like the Zim bonds. I don't know what the rate is going to be, but uh, knowing that the Zim bonds are going to be highly valuable, I would imagine that the agro checks will fall right in line with that. We don't do dates and rates here. We don't get into that stuff. We're looking at timeline and sequence of events so that you can draw your own conclusions based on the most factual information possible. But to answer that question, yes, agro checks will absolutely be honored, and I'm told that they'll be very worthwhile. Um, John, with the new digital system coming into play, uh, is Vietnam going to be uh, issuing new notes? No, they won't, because those notes have been in circulation for at least 20 years now, and we're going to a digital system based on assets. Let's be clear about that. We're not talking about the B system. We're talking about the new digital economic reality, which is based on, we've said many times before, the ISO 20022, which is all about tangible assets. That's what ties to Basel III and Basel IV, which makes the banks compliant. Compliant in the aspect that they have to be transparent about what their balance sheet's reflecting in terms of how much gold and silver they're holding. So no, you, they won't be issuing new notes. You don't need to be concerned with that as of right now. It's going to a digital platform I'm going to refer back to the original comment, making sure that your currency is legitimate and certifiable, that it's it's passes the smell test. You're going to be absolutely fine. So, John, let me just stop you there. So I, I do Please. actually get a lot of um, emails and people saying, how do we know if the currencies are are genuine? Is there a way to check some of these? Like, for instance, the, the Zims or the Dinars, if you can explain, uh, please, John. Absolutely. That's thank you for that because I was actually searching for another question. So you saved me the time. Yeah, that's that's an easy one. Yes, there is a way to determine this. What he what Chris is talking about ultimately is security watermark features. I'm sure the British pound has them. Every currency does. What that means is every currency on the front or the back there are distinguishable characteristics that make it legitimate. So the way to remedy that to Chris's Chris's question from the audience is you get yourself a black light. You can go online to Amazon, you know, eBay, YouTube, they're, they're all over the place. And, and you get a simple currency blacklight detector. It's a small box, it's about this big. You just plug it in. Uh, you, you can do it at night or you can do it and you can create a dark room, in your office or something, a, a low light area. And literally just simply put each currency underneath it. Within a second or two, if it's legitimate, it will light up. So an example would be on the dinar, the $25,000 nominations, which are, we'll get into a second, um, you'll put that on and a $25,000 note will light up quickly. And what they do is do these little yellow striations. They all, almost look like an indelible marker that's sort of randomly uh, squiggled across the back of the currency. The Indonesian rupiah, the, in, the entire royalty portion and the, the denomination light up at once. So they all separate from each other. So they're not done the same way they're staggered. But a black white black light, Chris, is the easiest way to uh, to remedy that and be sure that you have uh, authentic currency. Yeah, great. Okay. Have you got any other so another questions? another question I get, Chris? All the... yeah. Sorry, my my apologies. Um, yeah, another question I get is, uh, what denominations should we be looking for? My just personal opinion, it doesn't really matter. No. For Iraq, for example, the most common one that they always have is the twenty five thousand dollars denominations. Fifty thousand are good as well. Yeah. I personally like the larger ones. That's just me because you have more pliability with those. Um, you can't think of them the same way you think of U.S. currency with ones, fives, and tens because their denominations are different than ours. So that sometimes tends to be a bit of a trap. Uh, for example, with the Vietnamese dong, I like the five hundred thousand dollar, excuse me, five hundred thousand dollar denominations, uh, just because you know that's what I'm used to getting, and and you know. They're, they're gonna, the, that currency is going to be so valuable that having it in larger amounts is better for me. For you, you yeah. might prefer the one hundred or two hundred thousand dollar denominations. It all depends on your style, what you're going to use it for, um, you know, how you're going to invest it, those types of things. Uh, so it's really a preference. But my personal preference is the larger notes. Just you know, less. Also, when you go to exchange, there's less notes to break down. It's just easier that way from a time standpoint. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Another question, I'm trying to look for some of the most, bear with me, folks, looking for some of the most uh, common ones here. Um, how much time are we, are, oh, oh, here's one I get is, if the dollar is going down in value, how much time do we have before it's considered worthless? Well, that's a two-part question in the sense that 
the dollar's not going to go down to zero initially. We think on the index, it's probably going to go somewhere between 70 to 80. So it's going to lose about, give or take 30 to 50% in value initially, okay, before it gets asset backed, because we're doing an east-west reset. We've talked about that before. So in order for these other currencies to get their true value, the dollar has to step back a bit to make room for that to happen. Um, historical replication was that when the Kuwaiti dinar went off, they had 90 days to exchange. We will also have 90 days to exchange here uh, globally, uh, both in Europe and, and here in stateside. I, I can't speak as much to Europe as much as I can um, stateside, but for what I do know, historically it'll be 90 days. My humble recommendation, do what you want, is you, when you have that 90 days to exchange, that will still be a time where the dollar has perceived value as the systems are paralleling, right? So within that 90 days, my rec th this is what I'm doing, is I'm buying land, precious metals more so, uh, heirloom seeds, um, personal preference, you know, weapons, things for protection and, and recreational use, target practice at home, so on and so forth. Um, musical instruments that have bits of precious metals in them, pianos and the like that will retain their value. Things that you can physically touch that will retain their value. So that's my personal thing. You have to obviously know and decide what you're gonna do, but you will have at least 90 days to exchange and 90 days before that dollar uh, goes down to perceived value. Because remember, just like I'm sure Chris, there's people who live in the outskirts of the city, up in the country town, Surrey and the like, you have people here in America who live in remote areas and they need time to get to either a major bank or a tier two bank, which would be a credit union or community bank that might be partnering with a larger bank like a Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, what have you. So they're not, the, the establishment is not insensitive to that. There, there will be plenty of time to do this. So just don't need to panic. Just you know, take your time. Um, I recommend building a relationship with a wealth manager, taking one note get to know them. If you don't like that bank, you don't like that manager, find another one. There's plenty of options until you, you are comfortable with the position and the person with whom you're dealing. And then you can play along with them. They might say, hey, do you have any other currencies? I might. And they'll say, what do you have? I mean, you could say, well, what are you, what are you redeeming? Or what are you exchanging? And they'll say, you know, we have this, this, this. You say, yeah, I might have some of that. And they'll say, okay, well, here's my card. And you just simply say, Call me when it hits its full maturity. I can almost assure you within a week or so, you're going to be getting a call from that manager because um, the banks get what's called a 1%. That was another question I had is, um, what is the, uh, the cost? There are no taxes on this as there were no taxes when you bought it. What you paid was an exchange fee, a commission, the cost of doing business. Exchange centers, the banks, when you could buy currency from them, make money when you buy it and when you sell it. It goes both ways, just like anything else. It's a business, right? At the end of the day. So they're making a 1% basis point, right? Which is $100,000 here in America per transaction. So whether it's one transaction or 10, it's the same rate. But you're not paying taxes because you didn't pay them when you bought it. You paid an exchange fee. I think sometimes people are a little concerned or maybe they get that mixed up. And I just wanted to clarify that because you just everybody needs to stay calm. The, the All the countries have signed a tax treaty because they understand that if, if, if you treated this like a lottery, for instance, you'd be looking at a 50 to 60% tax. Yeah. That would defeat the purpose because what do people do when they get money? They spend it, they invest it. Yeah. If you take half or more of that away, people are going to hoard that in, in a fear modality and they're not going to invest in the GDP of their respective country. They understand that. The idea of this is to bless God's people and to rehydrate the economy with real assets. So taxes, especially at that rate, would clearly defeat the purpose. So I just want to give the viewers a little reassurance that this is well handled and just be thinking about how you can benefit others and how you're going to be able to bless your family and what your strategic plans are so that those dreams that you've been harvesting can actually take take hold. Yeah, thanks for that, John. Just um, no problem. another question. So this is going back to from my experience. OK, when I fa first found out about this, um, this currency revaluation, and I'm sure we've all been there where we go tell our friends, we go tell our families, they think we're crazy. They think uh, we've all heard it before. There's no way oh, that's yeah. ever going to happen. And so one thing I get questioned a lot when I'm talking about the currency revaluations, and it's the most common reply. 
and people will turn around to me and say, there's, for instance, I don't know the, the population of Vietnam, um, a few million, whatever it is, but they turn around and say, so does that mean everyone in Vietnam, whether they have a one million um, dongs note underneath their, their mattress or everyone's going to turn into a millionaire overnight? And this is something it's sometimes hard for me to explain to people. You're probably the better man to explain this, John. So is everyone in Vietnam in Iraq? and Indonesia are going to be overnight millionaires. So, and if they are, who's going to be cleaning the cars? Who's going to be serving the food and cleaning the streets if everyone wakes up a millionaire? What's your view on this? I'm going to start my business next week. You don't do it. Why do you listen to someone else, but not yourself? Why do you fulfill someone else's dream, but not your own? When will you wake up and start living your own life instead of living for someone else? Join us to improve yourself every day. Well, there's, yeah, it's a great question. And I have a, one more question behind that, actually, that's complimentary, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so that's a two-part question in my mind. The first the first thing is, okay, so what, here's what I can speak to yeah. with certainty. As far as Vietnam is, excuse me, so far as Iraq is concerned. So when this exchange happens, the citizens there are not getting the same rate that we are because they're getting a one-to-one. -one, so their currency will be leveled to the rate of the exchange of the BRICS being the new reserve currency so that they can be on a level playing field. They're getting oil revenue credits because they have so many oil fields there and the citizens aren't getting paid on that, right? So that's you know what we're waiting on is the oil and gas law to be signed so that all these different factions like the Kurds, the Shiites, the Sunnis can get paid their respective oil credits. So too will the citizens that have been living there who have gotten nothing for it. So they'll be getting that plus their one-to-one -one level rate the rate that we're getting here on the other side of the world is, you know, vastly different from them because we're not getting oil credits, nor do we need to, you know, so you take, you take a, uh, a state like Alaska, they get an annual stipend. I think I have a friend there, I think you think of like $1,500 a year or something like that, that they get, I believe it's once a year. So they're sort of the closest representation to what we're talking about. I'm not sure about Vietnam and how that's going to work or, or Indonesia because Viet Vietnam is not suffering the same uh, ailments, we'll say, or challenges that yeah. Iraq is. They they have a GDP, they have a manpower, they have a they have the uh, have a great workforce. Roughly seventy percent of the countries that left China went to Vietnam for manufacturing, yeah. right? So um, I am sure that they're going to be considerably more wealthy than they are today because they're struggling in poverty because their currency is so undervalued. Um, I believe that what might happen for them or most likely what happened for them is they'll experience Chisara, debt forgiveness, and their currency will level up like Iraq so that they, they have a fighting chance yeah. um, and, and can live in much more you know, chance of prosperity and freedom, which is really what everyone's seeking at the yeah. end of the day, where, no matter where you live. That I'm pretty certain. As far as what the rate's going to be, I can't speak to that, yeah. but I would have to imagine if it's one-to-one -one in, in Iraq, it's probably going to be similar you know, for Vietnam and the entirety of the world. Um, in terms of your second question, with respect to um, if people are wealthy, who's going to do the menial jobs or the everyday jobs? Here's how I look at that. So I believe that when people are free, they have more options. When they have more options, they can do a lot more. I always use the example here, Chris, in America, where you have the guy who works at the factory. He does it to feed his family. It's just the means to an end. But his real passion is on weekends, he's a classic car restorer. He loves restoring Corvettes, what have you. Yeah. And that's where he spends all of his time. You know, his wife can't even get him because he's in the garage, but, but she knows he's happy and she supports that. So that person will be able to make a business or a lifestyle out of doing that and ditch the factory job and be able to do what they love. And maybe they sell cars out of their home or maybe they restore them or what have you. Or maybe they open up a classic car store in town just so they can show their wares. Maybe they don't, maybe they charge much, much less. I, I don't know. It just depends on how they're yeah. positioned in life, but they'll be able to do what they love and make a great living at that where money won't be the objective of how they live. And that's yeah. what I see for the totality of the rest of the world. In terms of making up the gap for the menial jobs, I look at that in two ways. Firstly, there are people who love to clean or people who love to build things or people love to do manufacturing. There's people who like that stuff. 
those people can either get into it or get into more of it and drive that. We need yeah. people like that. We need more skilled tradesmen. If we have all these wealthy people and nobody to build the products and the houses, how's that going to work? So exactly. that's one. The, the gap will also be filled, Chris, by AI, which love it or hate it, it's, it's, it's coming. So that's why silver, we've talked about before, Chris, with Nick and other shows, is the most important metal because it's the driver for manufacturing, right? So, you know, AI robotics um, is, is kind of a, becoming more of a staple in manufacturing with respect to car manufacturing and other verticals. So I think it'll be a combination of humans who love doing that, coupled with working with AI technology. I know, for example, there was a video I saw weeks ago, I can't remember where it was, but the hotels are looking to um, have robotics and, and robots do the cleaning um, in hotels and in bathrooms and things like that, because they never stop, they don't take breaks, they're not on, they don't need benefits and things of that nature. So the people that are doing those jobs now it, it's just like in the industrial revolution here, um, Chris, in the 50s, people had to adapt and learn to do new skills and trades, but it it made their breadth and depth of knowledge and abilities much wider. Yeah. So while it, while on the surface, it looks like a detriment, in the end, I think it'll be an asset because people will be able to do more what they love and put their heart into something rather than just yeah. making a paycheck. So people won't just be working for a paycheck anymore. People are going to be doing things that they actually enjoy. I'm guessing there's going to be more people who are going to be wealthy, probably um, good people. I think there's a lot of good people in this community sure. and we're going to be using our money. We've got to remember there is probably still going to be poverty in the world. Even though this, um, this RV is happening, there probably is going to be some places of poverty where they're going to need the people, the people to gather together and make something happen for these for instance africa there's not much talks with um africa when it comes to um the currency re revaluations the, the hunger in africa and maybe would that get solved with the, maybe the the zimbabwe zimbabwe would they solve that problem i don't know would it be people like me and you humanitarian projects where we're going to be pumping our money back over there what's your views on that well, I think it's a combination, Chris. I th back to the, the previous answer I just gave you your other question. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a hybrid of the two. There'll be people like you and I, you know, I have my projects and things I want to do when I move. And, uh, you know, Kim Clement always talked about, you know, that the Lord's design for this wealth transfer was to feed the poor, the lonely, the hungry, the needy, the downtrodden. And there's a lot of great people out there who have a heart and compassion for, for people in that position who, who want to help. They're just looking for the opportunity. You know, some people who, you know, wealth is a driver. You have other people where money isn't so important. It's more about service. And at yeah. the end of the day, whether it's one or the other or both, the ultimate driver here is to use our passions to be of service to others, right? So I think that um, I think that uh, if there's poverty, it'll be significantly less than it is Minimal. now by at least 90 plus percent, if not more. Okay. Um, there'll be some homeless people who want to believe it or not be homeless here in California. I yeah. see it. I've talked to a few of them and prayed over them. And I said, Hey, if you know, if you had money and options, would you want to, would you want to get into a different way? You know, some, yes, but some were like, no, I, I like it. Here. I'm like, yeah. why? I said, why? And they said, because I don't have any responsibilities. I don't have any stresses. I can come and go. I said, and you're, you're okay with that. They're like, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's free will. Right. So I think the poverty thing will definitely be a thing of the past in the, because like I said, the wealth transfer, but also people's desire to get involved in that, you know, and as I said before, I have a project that I, I'm tasked with a team uh, that's really going to help a, a, a portion of society that, that really deserves and needs it most. Let me know when it's time, John, I want to join you with that. We can do it together. I'd be, help I'd, the world. I would, it's a pretty, it's a pretty special project and it's not one that, I had in mind, but it's not, it, it isn't about me. It's about God and God wanted to do this. And he showed me that he will fund it if I'm just obedient. And it's, it's frankly overwhelming, but it's important and it needs to be, it's a, it's an issue like poverty that needs to be dealt with. That has been so pervasive in our society, the entire world over going back to the beginning of time. Uh, one other quick question, Chris, that I got was when I talk about the wealth transfer, am I talking about Nasara? or the currency reset or something else? That's actually a really good question. And I'd like to address that. All of the above, 
this is a global reset. So let's define what that means. That means the currencies, the bonds, the cryptos, the precious metals. That means heirloom seeds. That could mean potential oil stocks, since oil is going to be a key driver for many countries like Iraq. And even here in the U.S., we're replete with it, right? Um, the cryptocurrency market and all that that entails with the ISO 20022 coins for the blockchain, other um, mean tokens that are going to have prominence. There's multiple wells, right? So it's it's a very, I've always said that the well transfer is not a tsunami, but it's a series of waves. Anybody who's been to the beach or a, a lake watches and observes the water, it comes in, it goes out, there's a tide. So what I like to do is have my hands open so the, tide, the, the money can come in and go out. Wealthy mindset people, not necessarily financially, but wealthy mindset people understand that they don't, they don't expect to lose. They don't have fear about the money not coming back. So they give generously. It comes back to them generously, right? It's you reap what you sow, you get what you give, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm referring to all of the above. I'm referring to the global reset, which I've just defined. I'm yeah. referring to Nassara. I'm referring to debt forgiveness. They're all intertwined. They're like, they're like freeways that intersect. They're, there's touch points of all three that come together and meet in an apex. And so that's what we mean by the wealth transfer when we talk about it. Okay. Thank you for that, John. Um, just, I want to get one more question okay. out of there. We're running out of time. Please. Well, one Please. question I keep seeing over and over again. You mentioned in one of your last videos um, about the 401k. Um, over here, we call it the pension. Um, there's not much we can do with our pension over here, unfortunately, in the UK. But I've heard mm. in the, um, where you are in the States, everyone's talking about like you mentioned last time, switching your 401k to physical gold or physical silver. Can you just explain that in a little bit more depth? And hopefully this clears all the all the questions asked. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, I, I get that question surprisingly more than I would think I would get it, but I get it at least two to three times a week. Friends of mine or people you know, on the channel will you know email or whatever, send a message some way and say, hey, you know, um, you talk about gold and silver all the time or platinum or, or you know, copper, um, you know, my money's tied up in my house or, you know, my job's not paying, whatever the situation is. Yeah. Uh, and I'm having trouble, uh, you know, getting into this until the wealth transfer happens. Any suggestions? And I'll say, well, do you have, um, you know, do you have, I don't know, do you have stocks that you can liquidate or do you have a, an IRA or 401k or something that you're not using? And some people are like, yeah, I do. But my job is saying that if I do that, I'm going to get penalized with 10% tax and they make it very difficult and restrictive uh, to get, you know, access, which should not happen. But we know the games that, uh, you know, the deep state and corporations are playing in lockstep. So I said, well, have you ever considered getting into a 401k uh, that would actually allow you to liquidate that into physical gold. And so there's a lot of good companies out there and like, yeah, but I'm not sure which one to go with. And I'm like, well, you have to do your own discernment and your own research and feel decide which one, you know, works best for you, but that might be a good avenue to pursue. So there are, there are companies out there um, that do that and specialize that are very good at doing it for a long time to alleviate that, that dilemma that a lot of people face. And, and I believe Chris, you've, um, partnered with one of those companies uh, so they can always you know check out our website and, and that's one recommendation that people can use to start investigating a way to uh, to get out of that uh, bottlenecking yeah so yeah we have we have partnered with our, one of them we'll leave uh, a link in the in the video description um yeah just check that out in your own time guys and uh, do your own research before going to any companies like we always say other than that, John, um, I think we should uh, leave the video there. Uh, one thing yeah. I do want to actually mention that I never mentioned before, I just want to congratulate you once again for coming on board to this channel. Um, you've pulled in all the viewers. Uh, I feel like the internet does need more people like you to keep doing what you're doing, spreading the truth. Mm -hmm. You was put in here, I feel like you were sent from above to put this information out there. So. Well, thank you, John, once again. And um, thank you a yeah, lot. if there's anything else you'd like to say to the viewers before we leave. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for saying thank you for, um, you know, thanks for the trust, Chris. I appreciate that. I know you're very discerning. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I just want the folks to know I'm not perfect. I'm human. I make mistakes like everybody. But 
the one thing you can count on is is that we're we're honest and we're making our best attempts to try to bring the truth to you in as many avenues as possible. You'll see the videos that we make and interviews we do. We're trying to reach a broad reaching constituents of society. Uh, you know, for example, people like Scott Thomas um, on the financial advisor side from a Christian standpoint, who does recommend gold and silver and the currencies to his clients after doing diligence of prayer. Um, we're answering your questions as openly and honestly as we're able. We're going to continue to improve on this. Um, this is an op this is a baby that's growing. There's growing pains and things. So just be patient with us as we get through it. We are listening to you. We are uh, answering your questions to the best of our ability and, and you know, reading the content to try to get you answers so you don't feel ignored. Um, just just keep sticking around. And uh, I think you're going to see it's going to get better and better and better. And uh, we have some shows today, as you know, Chris, that I think are going to go a long way towards achieving that. But we're not going to give you uh, false hope. We're not going to give you dates and rates. We're not going to say today, today, tomorrow, 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 um, because it doesn't work that way. It, this is God's gift. And he's going to pick it. And it's going to be a suddenly moment. Like Kim Clement said, why, why now? When everything in the world, you think it's chaotic now, just wait. And everything in the world builds to this tempest. It'll be like that. And, and one more thing I want to say, Chris, to the audience is that uh, this was another question is, John, how are we going to know what to do when it comes time to exchange? Well, we will we will aid you in that. We will give you a template of suggestions of what we we are going to do ourselves when we go into the bank and, you know, how to dress, how to present yourself. People should bring with you a simple dialogue that you can have um, with the wealth managers and how to approach them so that you can get the best results possible. So we're here for you every step of the way. We're not we're not leaving until the job is done. So we also teach that on the 1% club. So that's another thing. If you guys want to check that out, you, you'll learn a lot. Like I said, we're trying to teach mm. everyone how to escape the system. And that's it. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for that. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for coming out from the shadows. We appreciate it. And have a great day, everybody. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon, guys. Take care.